Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is David Lesher. I'm the editor of Cal Matters. Uh, for those of you who don't know Cal Matters, we are an independent nonprofit news organization that covers the major issues in the state of California since we launched about five years ago. So tonight you are attending our event, Rebuilding and Resiliency, How We Need to Handle Wildfires From Now On. As you know, this year has been another milestone for wildfires in the Western United States. Here in California, we've already had 8,700 fires that have burned more than 4 million acres. Uh, Oregon and Washington have also seen record setting fires and, an, and a fire near Boulder, Colorado on Saturday is now the worst wildfire in that state's history. So tonight we're gonna examine wildfires through the lens of a new documentary by Academy Award winning director, Ron Howard called Rebuilding Paradise. It will air on National Geographic Channel on Sunday, November 8th at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and it will mark the two year anniversary of the Camp Fire, the deadliest and most destructive fire in California history that tore through the town of Paradise. As you'll see shortly, a spark turned into a perfect storm that's, that killed 85 people and destroyed or damaged 19,000 structures. Tonight's event is in two parts. First, uh, Rachel Becker, an environment reporter at Cal Matters, will talk with some of those involved in the film about the campfire's impact on paradise. In the second half, Julie Cart, our Pulitzer Prize winning environment reporter, will talk with a panel tasked with preparing California for fires and how to make the, Cal the Golden State more resilient. In this part, we'll wanna hear your questions. So we'll invite you to use the chat box during that, during that period, which you can see the chat button at the bottom of your screen. We also want to thank Ron Howard and his team at Imagine Entertainment who filmed uh, Rebuilding Paradise, as well as National Geographic, the senior producer for the film. So we'll start things off with the trailer for Rebuilding Paradise and thank you again for joining us. Pray for us. We're getting out of here. Oh my god. Oh my god. I need an ambulance immediately. We are 100 percent surrounded by fire. All people trapped. It's everywhere. Not you are on fire. November 8th at 7:30 in the morning, this town started to burn down. And within three hours it was gone. The state's deadliest and most destructive wildfire in history. The town of Paradise is basically ash. I lost my house too. I'll tell you what, it's not easy. No, it's not, but we're alive. It's not just that I lost my house, it's not that I lost my memories. My entire way of life is completely gone. As hard as it is to say, I don't see the town coming back. A lot of people have left. The hospital's gone. The elementary school's gone. I thought it would get easier as time went on, but it's actually getting harder. At the end of the day, I have nowhere to go. Paradise water may not be drinkable for up to three years. We have to make them pay for everything because it's going to happen again if we don't. Don't we have a responsibility to stop building if it's going to be in areas that are not defensible? This is my home. This is where I want to be. I love that town, and I'm not going to bail on it now. We're coming back. Look at this clear sky! Look hey, clear, clear sky, sky, guys! Oh, you're lying. Made it through! <laughs> Made it through it, guys! That was a heart-wrenching look at what happened in paradise. I'm Rachel Becker, an environment reporter at Cal Matters. And this conversation comes as we approach the two year anniversary of the campfire sparked by PG&E power lines on the morning of November 8th, 2018. As Dave said, it was California's deadliest and most destructive fire on record. And the people of paradise trying to rebuild their lives, their homes and their community are still feeling its effects years later. Now we're back in peak fire season after what's already been a record breaking year. And things are looking really dry out there. 
There are a lot of things going on. We've got climate change, doubling extreme fall fire weather, lengthening the fire season, increasing annual area burned fivefold over the past four decades. We've got land management practices that leave fuel just ready to ignite. And we've got a growing number of Californians potentially in harm's way. Over the next 40 plus minutes, we'll see a few more clips. Uh, we'll talk about the fire, the film, and what we can learn from what the people of paradise have experienced. Joining us are Zan Parker, a producer on the documentary, former Cal Fire Chief Ken Pimlot, and campfire survivors Woody Culleton and Michelle John, whom you'll recognize from the trailer. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I wanna Thank start Thank you for off. having us. Great, I see all your faces. Um, welcome, and uh, I wanna start off with one of the scenes in the film that shows Paradise firefighters talking about the conditions that converged to make the campfire just so catastrophic. And after that, I'm gonna ask Ken and Woody to talk to us about that day. So let's see the clip. The, the reality is, is that it was November 8th and we hadn't had any kind of significant rain. It had always rained before trick or treating, right? right? I mean, right. And now, and now we're in these patterns here where we don't see rain until you know into November. That morning, the wind cranked up, and you know you're kind of waiting, like what's coming next? In this particular case, it was a fire eight miles away, throwing up a column full of embers and the ash. Darkest, blackest, calm smoke I've ever seen. And then a forty mile an hour wind taking that over the top of Paradise in perfect alignment and dropping it on the town of Paradise. And so it really was the perfect storm. We lost a hundred and some thousand acres of land. There was multiple fires burning for at least a week, probably more. We just tried to save what we could save and, and help people along the way is about all we could do. It didn't matter if we had a thousand fire engines lined up on the ridge that day, this was going to happen. Everything lined up perfectly that day for this to happen. So Ken Pimlot, you're retired now, but you were the chief of Cal Fire, the state's firefighting agency at the time. Um, we know now that PG&E's equipment sparked the flames, but what else was going on to create that perfect storm? And what have we learned since then about protecting places like Paradise? Yeah, you know, and you heard the firefighters talk about what was going on that morning. Uh, that fire didn't start on November 8th. It really started years before. The conditions, we had been battling fires uh, that were get, becoming progressively worse uh, for you know, several years prior. And uh, we were in, just coming out of the throes of a five-year drought, the worst drought the state um, had ever experienced. Uh, and we were in fire weather conditions. Red flag warnings had been uh, put in place. Uh, resources had been moved in, in, in place in anticipation of, of a wind event. But as they said uh, in the video clip, it was the perfect alignment of critically dry fuels that had been parched from uh, you know, years of drought uh, and wind that surfaced in just the right place at intensities of you know, well over 40 miles an hour sustained uh, and the ignition source, the, the, the power line that started that. And um, all of that was the, the perfect precursor to allowing that fire to not only start, but to spread very quickly uh, into paradise. You know, literally with, within just a few hours, it was burning through paradise. Woody, you've lived in Paradise for almost 40 years, served on the town council for 12 of them. You've been Paradise's mayor. Take us back to that morning when you had to evacuate. And what did you learn that day that you think other Californians should know? You had to keep your gas tank full at all times. Um, you know, um, the, the fire, um, I, had, I worked about 20 miles away in the valley and I had gone to work at 6.30 in the morning and the fire started about 6.35, about eight or nine miles away from us as a crow flies. I happened to have a scanner. The fire was in, in our town by the hospital by 7.10, 7.12 in the morning. Um, everybody lost communications at some point. And it wasn't, um, I, I drove back home, uh, 
back to my home, which is at the upper end of town. I got there about 7.30, 20 to 8. And uh, there was fire all over town at that time. And we left our home probably about 8.30, quarter to 9. And it took us five and a half hours to get out of town. The roads were completely jammed with vehicles. There was fire throughout town. Uh, I mean, it was... It was, you know, it, like I said in the beginning of the movie, within three or four hours, our town was gone. You know, it burned for a while after that, but it was just, it was horrendous. Did you feel like you had enough warning and enough information? There was no warning. There was no warning. There was no warning. There, what people don't understand is that when you have a catastrophe like that, of that magnitude, the winds were blowing in the Jarbo Gap winds. They were, the winds at the high school were clocked at 100 plus miles an hour. They created fire tornadoes. The winds were, they were shifting direction every which way. They were, they were way in excess of 40 mile an hour winds, but um, it moved so rapidly, you know, uh, there was no warning. People would call 911 at 7.15 in the morning seeing the ashes falling in their yard. And they would say, gee, is there a fire? Should I evacuate? And dispatch didn't even know. They said, no, the fire's in Jarbo Gap. Uh, there's no fire in paradise. That's what people were told. And then shortly after that, all communication went away. Your cell phones quit working. You know, the towers burned up, stuff burned up. So you didn't have any, and we didn't have a warning system. You know, we had one 30 years ago, we had a siren, but uh, we don't have one now. And maybe we still don't have one today, two years later, but maybe Ken, in another year we'll have one. Ken, did Cal Fire also experience that bottleneck, that communication bottleneck that Woody is talking about? And how did that affect your ability to respond? Absolutely. Uh, for, you know, when we got first reports uh, of the fire, obviously it was uh, all the resources were engaged in responding to and evacuating people. And uh, very quickly, uh, the smoke inversion came down over town, so aircraft couldn't see in. The wind was so intense they couldn't fly. Uh, and firefighters and law enforcement were extremely busy conducting rescues and saving lives. Couldn't get a lot of information out on the progress of the fire. We knew that there was a potential for many fatalities uh, and large structural damage and loss, but it was very challenging. It was moving so rapidly to get any kind of, um, you know, intel report on where the fire was going, uh, you know, what parts of the community were involved, all of that. Um, it was very difficult in those first few hours. Before we talk with producer Zan Parker about making this film, let's hear from Ron Howard about how he came up with the idea for it. Um, here's an interview uh, with director Kevin Smith at the Sundance Film Festival. Hey man, it's me, Kevin Smith, and look, we are sitting down with an icon. Everyone give it up for Ron Howard. <laughs> All right, man, so we're gonna talk about a lot of things, but first off, you're here this year with a, a documentary. Right, it's called Rebuilding Paradise. And it's about the Paradise Fires. Right, fires in Northern California where 95% of the town was burned down. Uh, and I, I happened to know something about that town because my mother-in-law had lived there until she passed. She'd lived there for about five years. And so I'd spend some time in Paradise, have a lot of family in Reading. They'd just gone through their own horrible fire. Right. My family came out unscathed, which was a relief. And then suddenly it hit Paradise and it, it started to become personal. And I wondered, you know, once the cameras leave, once the spotlight's off, then what's it like? What's left? What, how do you endure something like that? And uh, and so it became my first verite documentary. I've, you know, I've done, I did The Beatles eight days a week. Right, you've Pavarotti. been doing documentaries. I like love them. them. They're fascinating to work on, but here's one where you have no idea what your story is really gonna be. So you just went down and fly on the wall there yes, for a while? Yes, yes. And- Is uh, it tough not to get involved in people's lives at that point? Well, I, I, I think we all did in a way, but of course you also have to keep your, you know, a measure distance, of distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that, that uh, slowly but surely, um, I think we found individuals who were, they were really showing up. They were the ones that were gonna fight for this. Mm -hmm. And I think we took a lot of inspiration from that. And also they, they were willing to allow us to keep coming into their lives. And it wasn't always pretty what we were getting on camera. It was, what was, was the worst pain. devastation that you saw that like impact? Most people see a news report and they're like fires, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But you it's, uh, saw homesteads erased, uh, lives erased. They lost 85 lives. They lost 85 life. lives. And, and uh, the, uh, but I think um, to the couple of things, they're, they're um, not to, I don't want to give away too much about the film, mm -hmm. but, but when I first went 
uh, into the Red Cross whole, you know, areas, um, the looks on um, kids' faces, not young kids, they were just sort of either oblivious or kind of stunned, but teenagers whose parents were just devastated. Mm-hmm. And you could just see this 13, 14 year old guy or girl thinks they have to carry the load now. Right. And that was uh, very emotional to me. And, uh, and also to see grown, capable people, mm. not, not, not people who'd made horrible decisions in their lives, people who'd done all the right things. And still got suddenly punished. So, vo- so punished, yeah. so vulnerable. You kind of feel like, you know, bad things can happen but um, you know, this is not this is not what you believe your society you know uh, 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 you know uh, ought to have to cope with. So, Zan, as a producer, you arrived in paradise uh, from the East Coast after the flames were out, you know, as Ron Howard said, you know, when the residents were still raw from this tragedy and still bracing for the recovery ahead. um, What still stays with you from those early interviews? Well, I wasn't the first one there. I have to tell you, um, there was a great California filmmaker who came before me, Tracy Draws Tragos, who's from LA. Uh, and she was the first one who met Michelle and uh, a few other important folks in Paradise. And Ron was with them. That was in, I think they came in late November and in early December. And then I joined the team in and sort of took over for Tracy in January. Um, it was, you know, it, it did look like, a bombed out city from a war. It absolutely was unrecognizable. I now know from having seen so many pictures of it from before that it was a completely changed environment. And I have to say that what struck me, and it's important to note that I did get there two months after the fire, but what struck me actually was the fact that almost everyone that I met you know, I would express sympathy and then they would immediately say back, it's okay, I'm alive, I've got my family. And that's what matters. And of course that is what matters, but if you haven't been through something like that, you don't really know what that means. And it really took months of kind of sticking with the people that we were filming and that we became friends with in paradise to understand what they really meant. I think actually all of us know more, those of us certainly on the East Coast who don't suffer through fires, um, know more what that means just having gone through this bizarre year. Woody, I can see you're feeling some strong emotions. Is there something you wanted to say? No, okay. Michelle, John, you were the, the superintendent of Paradise's schools during and after the campfire. Schools were destroyed, damaged, unusable. You had staff and students who had lost their homes, who were displaced. You saw enrollment drop by more than half and everybody, including you, had just undergone this collective trauma. How do you manage a school system, students, teachers, education after something like that? And and what advice do you have for others who will be in that same situation? Well, you triage, you you put the kids first and the families first and you find them and you find your staff. First thing you do for it took us almost three weeks to find everybody uh, because there was no communication. So you, you work down, you work down, teachers find kids, you know, union people find staff, we find everyone and we, talk to parents and we said, what do you need? We, we went to the, you know, the shelters and everyone said, what do you need? And they said, we need our kids to be together. We need our kids to be with our te- their teachers who love them. They've lost everything they've had and they need to know they're loved. So we said, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna find a place for our teachers to be with our kids. And we're not as worried right now about academics as we are about the whole child and the post-traumatic stress and the mental health and the emotional health and were people getting enough food, you have to go to that whole triangle. So you find your people and you listen and then you, you don't take no for an answer. You get them together with their teachers. You, you ask for help. 
you ask your fellow educators, do you have a classroom I can have? I have a teacher and kids, I, I will bus to you. And then they all came through for us in the, in the Butte County area. The documentary really focuses on, on Michelle's work, um, rebuilding the schools and, and rebuilding that part of the community. Um, and it also focuses on the struggles people faced in, in rebuilding their homes and just the, the onslaught of challenges from the cleanup effort to water contamination that towns across California are, are going to keep seeing. Um, and there's one scene in this film that to me really captures the thread of hope that, that kind of stretches through Rebuilding Paradise. Uh, and I'd like for us to watch this clip and, and talk about the rebuilding process. Um, Woody is the star of this scene, which shows him getting the permit he needs to rebuild his house in paradise. Town of Paradise permit to build my home at 1552 Forest Service <laughs> Road. I'm Jazz. Awesome, man. Awesome. This is it. Yeah. Do that, buddy. We're on now. This is the beginning. Ha! Excited. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> just finally caught up with me. <laughs> wow. <sighs> yeah, it's a big deal. It is a big yeah, deal. it's a big deal. Very New big. New beginning. Oh, wow. I didn't know I had all that going on. <laughs> Funny how it catches you, huh? Yeah, well. Far out. So, Woody, talk to us about what this moment meant to you and why you decided to stay. Uh, I can't turn on my video. All right. There. Uh, uh, what is it? You know, that was a big deal. It was the beginning of, you know, uh, I don't know. I, you know. You know, we decided to stay because of my home. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, I reinvented. <laughs> that really got me. Uh, it's where I reinvented myself in my life. But it's where I'm safe. It's where my wife and my daughter were safe. It's, it's what we know. It's everything that we had built over 30 plus years. And, and, uh, and it was taken away in a day. And, and uh, um, so when we finally got, to, and it was a battle to get those permits. We, were, we weren't allowed in town for a month and a half. Um, you know, a lot of, there was just challenges and there still are. Um, but so it was a big deal to get the permits. And then that day when we actually got to dig the footing, that's when, um, you know, um, everything just kind of hit me, you know, and, and it's still going on. I mean, when we watch the, the opening credits today, you know, uh, it still gets me. When, every time I watch the film and see the graduation scene, I break out in tears. Um, everybody that lived here and lived through that experience and, and had to escape with their lives um, has been changed. We talk about PTSD, but um, none of us know what that was. The veterans do, and the fire first responders know, but most people don't know what that is. And all of us now know what that is. And, 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 uh, and it doesn't go away in six months, in a year. I don't think it ever goes away. Uh, this yeah. year, you've seen the North Complex fire threaten paradise <laughs> again. I mean, yeah. what did that feel like and that was, did you feel better prepared no that was, no heck no no we still got the same skinny roads and no way out um we're that was horrific it was absolutely the everything exactly like it was on november 8 2018 except there were no flames and there were no uh, embers there was ash there was wind there was at nine o'clock in the morning darkness and 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 people were so traumatized that thousands of people left left here, left paradise again. Well, we, didn't, we don't have thousands of people here anymore, but above us in Megalia, they have about 10,000. And people just left because they were afraid they were not gonna live through it again. Absolutely not. And there are so many that are not even coming back. They just cannot, they'd never be able to do it again. So it, yeah, it, it was frightening. It triggered a lot of, a lot of fear. Michelle, you've retired as superintendent. You're living in Reno now. 
Do you think you'll ever move back to paradise and do the recent fires change that feeling at all? You know, I, there's been so many changes in my life that I'm not exactly sure. I do still own a couple pieces of property in paradise and uh, I'm waiting to see what happens. I very thrilled at all of the rebuilding, but just taking a step back and like Woody said, the PTSD is so traumatic and I still talk to teachers every day and try and help teachers, but I, I need to have some separation right now from paradise. Woody, do you regret your decision to stay? No, 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 I'm here. I'm here. It's no, I'm, you know, this is my forever home. Uh, this is where I will die, but hopefully from natural causes, not from a fire. Uh, no, and, and you know, and what, what, um, what we learned, because I was on the city council and the mayor during the 2008 fires, what we learned and we learned from this one is, is I want to be part of rebuilding this community. Um, and, and I want to honor what the, how this community was founded. This was a very diverse community of, of all social economic standards. And there are powers at play that would like to say, oh, goody, we have a clean blackboard. We can just create a brand new town the way we want. Well, we're not going to be... Uh, some little Lake Tahoe town or something. We're going to be what we always were. We were known as Poverty Ridge back in the 1800s. This town has been here over 100 years. So the people that are here are pioneers, and, and, and I want to be part of that new pioneer spirit and help bring it back. And I want to make sure that we can uh, honor our history and, 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 and help people come back. Because right now, government at every level is getting in the way of people coming back. You know, they have pretty heartless. I mean, they're okay. Don't I shouldn't be so harsh on them. We're seeing wildfires worsening as a result of climate change, um, among other factors that we've already talked about. Um, but Zan, the end of the documentary really places what happened in paradise in this broader context of disasters and extreme weather events that climate change is making worse. Um, what do you hope that viewers will take away from that? And how do you hope that this sort of colors how people view the rest of the film? That's an excellent question. Um, that was actually a really hard decision to make to put that in the film because we wanted the film very much to be about paradise and the people of paradise. You know, it was there are, are incredible towns and a lot of really um, impacted people that are right around paradise. Um, like uh, Michelle and Woody said, uh, Megalia is really close by and Concow is really close by, which is was just completely burned down. Um, but we, we kind of decided just to hone in on paradise to get that feeling of a community going through this together. I actually think that while we do while the images seem to say, look at climate change, it's going on everywhere. The key thing is to remember that the experience that the people in paradise had and are having, and that the viewers just watched for 90 minutes is the same experience that all those people and all those tragedies are having. And the idea is actually to really engage with and empathize with that that feeling of loss, that feeling of a changed environment, of, of, of getting PTSD, not just because you went through a horrific event, but also because everything around you looks different, feels different, your environment is completely changed. And that keeps happening all over the world. And I, the more that people have empathy for those human beings all over who've gone through it, and animals do too, that's really important, wild animals too that are very affected by these things. When we have that empathy, that's what we don't want. That's what we want to stop. That affects us. It's hard to look at an iceberg falling into the ocean and care as much as when you see a whole community of people working so hard to get back what they had. Can I, can I add something there? Uh, the I, for me, the point of that film was, was the teenagers at the end of the film, that's the connector. Because like the, the girl says, and, and it's unfortunately, if you're not listening and paying close attention, you miss it. She says, you know, we're collecting these quarters or these nickels for the people in Alabama that just had a devastating thing. She says, you know, I always used to see it on the news and I thought, oh, how sad, but now I know how they feel. That's the deal. 
That's Thank you, Woody. That's yeah, that was actually yeah. a, a genius move on the part of our editors yeah. to put that in because Ron wanted to put in the disasters around the world. And we were thinking, well, how are we going to make that work? And but we had filmed that. It was actually on our first trip, Michelle, when we very first visited yeah. the high school, which was in an old Facebook office building on the campus of the airport in Chico, California. <laughs> it was they were doing their best, but it was a rough place to go to school. And yeah. they, you know, these kids were, you know, they have this amazing activities director at the high school, Stacy and um, what's Martin. her last name? Yeah, Stacy Martin. Martin. She was so great. And we reached out to her to say we were coming. She said, oh, we're going to do a fundraiser for the Alabama tornado victims. And we thought, wait a second, you all have empathy for other people you have your hearts are big enough that you're giving to other people but that is very much true of the town of paradise it's and yeah. i think it's true of americans yes yes can i just say i love those kids and love stacy martin they 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 get it yeah. they get it ken we've been talking about um the kind of re-traumatizing nature of um disasters across the world. Um, and we've been seeing just fire after fire tearing through California and the West. Uh, and this year is no exception. Um, what kind of toll does this onslaught of wildfires take on our on firefighters, on our first responders, on, on you? And, and now two years later, you're retired. What stays with you? So what we're seeing now and have for the last years is unlike anything that first responders um, had dealt with. I mean, we are used to fires in California and having a fire siege, but they were the exception to the rule, maybe once a year. This is all year now and uh, firefighters aren't getting off duty. I mean, they're working a month or more at a time and, and maybe getting a day off and going right back on. And they're doing this all summer. And it's not just Cal Fire, it's all of our almost a thousand fire departments around California. And then, and of course, now we've asked for help from all over the country. Um, it's wearing and we can't sustain a model where we're putting our people through this kind of endurance all the time. And so it's really how do you take a look at strategies and tactics and how we engage in this for the for the long haul? Um, you know, we had, you know, being in leadership when this fire occurred, it affected even the leadership. I mean, we knew people who knew the town. Our, some of our leadership grew up in that town and lost their childhood homes and, and lost people that they grew up with. So it had a very personal uh, effect on many, many people. And you can't really sit and listen to what we're talking about now and not just think back to, you know, November 8th and, and, and what people were going through. Um, this fire, unfortunately, is, is what we're going to be seeing into the future because of the conditions we're having. And I think Woody really said it best, you know, yes, government can be challenging. Uh, we have to learn from the people of paradise as to what's working and what's not. And uh, we have to do this together. This is not a government alone. This is government private. This is all of us trying to work on solutions to all of it. It's our forest management. It's our better preparing communities, better working on response notifications, all of that. It's a team effort. We have a lot of work to do, but we have so much to learn from Michelle and Woody and so many people in paradise that experience this firsthand. So I wanna take the last five minutes to, to address a question that you heard asked by California lawmakers during the trailer. <laughs> should we even rebuild next to nature and the most beautiful parts of the state and the wildland urban interface that is so vulnerable to wildfires? And I wanna give you each about a, a minute uh, to share your thoughts. And I wanna start with Woody. Oh yes, we should build in the wild urban wildland interface. You know, it's our home and it's like, uh, it's just, you know, they rebuild houses on the on the shores of Alabama and New Orleans and Texas where the hurricanes come. You, you got all the housing in San Francisco and Oakland on the fault line. So yeah, we should, the tornado alleys, you rebuild where your home is and where you live. You know, our problem going forward that nobody's mentioned yet is that there's over 300,000 dead trees in our town from the fire. There's over 4 million dead trees in the state of California because of this year's fires. And yet there's nobody taking them down or any place to take the wood once we take it down or to use the wood in a meaningful and energy efficient way. So I'm gonna be fighting for that whole thing later on. Michelle, what do you think? I, I agree with Woody, absolutely. It is our home and if personal tragedy would not have occurred, I would still be there. Yeah. Uh, 
it, it it's our home. I let, when people ask me where I'm from now, I still say paradise. I'm not from Reno, I'm from paradise. And yes, we should absolutely be able to rebuild in our home and be able to get fire insurance. Yeah. I don't know the answers or how to do that, but we should be able to get it. Woody, Cheap, were you cheaply. able to get fire insurance now? Yeah, yeah, I was. Thanks to Allstate Insurance Company, they did not, they no longer insure homes in California. But what they did is they called my complete rebuild of a total destruction of my home a remodel. So I still have fire insurance. Wow. I hope I didn't get him in trouble for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and Zan, you know, coming from the East Coast, having spent so much time watching the rebuilding process, what do you think? Should we be rebuilding in the wildland urban interface? You know, it's a funny thing to say to Californians, the rest of you are Californians, but <laughs> I, I, I honestly think that question is not the question to ask. Um, I know it's the question that in California you have to answer, just like we have to answer for are we going to rebuild after hurricanes, but um, it's where you live and it is an incredibly beautiful place and it is a huge economy and an amazing state and there is nothing like the North State. There's nothing like the people who live on the ridge and the beauty there. I just... I, who is anyone to say no? Ken, what do you think? It's certainly easy to sit back after and say, no, just stop building there. That's not the reality for all of what you just heard. The, the, the people, this, this, the, for the whole, this is where people are from and, 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 and equate to. What we have to do going forward, though, is recognizing how can we be smarter about how we're doing it? Paradise knew where what was going. They were working on reductions of the fire problem. We have to really redouble those efforts in all of our communities in the West to try to make these communities more uh, resilient to fire, uh, so that we can, you know, withstand that. Obviously, everybody has a stake in that. The, you know, the, re the responders to these fires come from all over the state and and the country, and the costs are borne by everyone. So everybody's got a responsibility to help work on this. But just as Zan said, is who are we to tell people, you know, what they value, where they live, but let's do it smartly. Let's work together to find ways to help protect these communities and, and make real difference on it. I think we've really got to increase the pace and scale of the work to, to get it done. And if I can just add to that, I just want to shout out to the fire safe councils, which are something I, that East Coasters don't even know what that is. Um, but it's such a neat thing. And it is all community members who volunteer their time just working with small grants to do a lot of the work that Ken just mentioned. And I think it's just an, it's an example of how like a community comes together and helps each other. So I think that's a, a good thing for everyone to look into across California. Yeah, but they'll spend, they'll spend millions of dollars to fight fires and to clean up after fires, but there's very little funding from those higher up levels of government to put in the fire, to do all fire the preparation. To, yeah, you know, they don't fund them. You know what I mean? That's a problem. I we know, have a few a uh, reader questions or viewer questions um, that I, we have a few minutes to address. So um, we've touched on this a little bit, but um, one uh Mar Mack asks um, about upgrades to evacuation routing um, and building hardening. And um, others have also asked about improvements to evacuation notifications. Um, Woody, Michelle, Ken, uh, what are you guys seeing? Well, I, I think we had evacuation notifications, but when you have a perfect storm and all communication goes down, nothing worked at all. I. I, it's seriously, we resorted to walkie talkies within our district. And even that was hard to get through on walkie talkies. Nothing, the cell tire, towers were gone, everything. So I, I think that we, we have to be careful with, with judging people. We had evacuation routes. We had practiced going one way in our town. We had had meeting after meeting with go bags. People had go bags. You can prepare all you want. And we had prepared. And then there was the perfect storm. And in three hours, everything was gone. So that and doesn't we, take away preparing. Please prepare people. And my biggest takeaway is when firefighters or any professional tell you to leave, you do not question them. You leave with a full tank of gas, like what he said, but you leave <laughs> Yeah, you know, and the problem is, like Michelle said, we, we had practiced uh, 
evacuation routes. We learned in 08 what to do. We we had zones. So because in 08 fire, which was a small little fire, uh, we had everybody flooding into a couple of roads and it was a disaster. Well, in this fire, it moved so fast. We had like 30 plus thousand people on every road going on road, bike trails, dirt roads, everything driving across lawns and sidewalks to get out of town. There was no place to go. And it was absolute gridlock. And one of the problems that they have for first responders and, and disaster planners is once we got off the ridge down to like uh, Neal Road or Clark Road to Highway 99, now you're, you're intersecting with a major highway in the middle of the day with all this traffic on it. And it's about it's about changing things, you know. There, there's other bottlenecks down the road, you know, not just in, in the town, but it was horrendous. There was no movement, you know. I, I think the, um, Michelle at the nail on the head, this, this happened so quickly, even with the preparations in place, uh, how could you get out ahead of something that was within paradise within an hour or two? Uh, but now we've learned from that. And I think how we conduct evacuation orders, how the communication centers are communicating. Now we know a fire that starts in Polka could end up in paradise uh, that quickly. So we can be thinking about that as we're training and working in our communication centers. Uh, we, we know that the Public Utilities Commission is working on, uh, they're requiring uh, cell phone providers, cell phone towers to be have backup generation for 72 hours. So trying to continue to harden that infrastructure, whatever we can do to put our communications facilities uh, in place that withstand these. I mean, there are continual things that we can continue to work on. And I know we'll hear more about those things in, in part two, but uh, there are you know, lots of things we can continue to work on uh, video, there's lots of video camera networks alert wildfire throughout California. So there's, we're better able to monitor when fires start and look at conditions, weather uh, stations, just getting better at doing all of that. So we have more reaction time when these things happen. Okay, we have time for one last uh, reader question from Fire Safe Sonoma. Um, back to Woody's point um, that where do you live instead? There is no safe zone. So what's the best way to adapt? You build with WUI compliant building materials. And we're, we're making a lot of changes on that. You know, like uh, one of the things they say is that yeah, we used to be able to attach our wooden fence to our house. And uh, now that becomes a wick. So one of the things in new building codes is you cannot have uh, within five feet of your house, a wooden fence attached to it. So, um, you know, that's something... What, there's flaws in all of that too, though. Like I had to have my new building codes, fire codes. I have to have thermal uh, windows, window glass has to be thermal rated or something, but they're still uh, wrapped around in vinyl plastic. A milk carton is actually the framework for the glass. So when you have a fire like the campfire, which was like, it was melting plastic pipes under the ground. It was 2,500 degrees out there. You know, it was, and it was like a blowtorch. So the window frame melts, the embers blow into your house and your house burns from the inside out. You know, uh, we saw a lot of stucco homes. That's what happened to them. You know, well, I think they have metal frames. So you gotta use proper building materials, but the building industry, they need to come up with some even better materials. And, and then now that drives the cost of rebuilding through the roof, you know. Ken, do you have any last words of advice for Californians facing, you know, potentially a long fire season ahead as it continues to stay dry. We, we really have to be treating uh, these conditions when we have red flag warnings, fire weather watches. We need to be thinking about them like they're uh, a tornado warning uh, in the Midwest or a hurricane on the East Coast. I, we can't have it be white noise. We need to know exactly, I mean, we need to be thinking the fire's right going on right now the second we see that there's red flag warnings, which are literally in place throughout parts of California uh, now. Um, that's the hyper awareness that we need to have. And, and like Michelle said, being ready, the go bag, all of those things, because we don't, we don't, we won't have time as everybody in paradise found out. It literally, you need to be able to walk out to your car, get in it and leave that second. And that's the mindset we need to have every fire season. It doesn't mean we need to live in fear, but we need to have a very uh, strong appreciation for the conditions that we're in, how deadly they can be and, and, and just be ready for it and listen to what we're all talking about all the time and, and, and take it to heed. 
And, and remember, your gas tank being full is a really important part of that, same as a go bag, because you may be in traffic for hours. There could be a telephone pole laying in the road blocking it. Somebody in front of you runs out of gas and blocks the escape route. You know, that's how people die. And so uh, it just makes sense because, you know, most people were stuck in traffic for four to five hours trying to get out of town. It took a long time. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories with us today. Um, we have to wrap things up so we can move on to part two, uh, I know, uh, which will be moderated though by my amazing colleague, Julie Cart. Uh, and I wanna end this great conversation with another scene from Rebuilding Paradise. And it's kind of the, the culmination of that thread of hope that I mentioned. Um, and it's it shows that even in places that are just devastated by wildfires. It's possible to, to rise from the ashes, um, as you'll see in this video of Michelle John and, and her former students at Paradise High School. Um, I really want to, just from the bottom of my heart, thank Woody, uh, Michelle, Zan, and Ken for joining us and talking about your lives, um, the campfire, and, and how it changed uh, everything for you. Um, Thank you again to Imagine Entertainment and National Geographic Channel. Uh, and a reminder that Rebuilding Paradise uh, will make its broadcast on the Nat Geo channel on Sunday evening, November 8th, the two year anniversary of the campfire. So stick around uh, to see another great clip of Rebuilding Paradise and we'll be back shortly with part two on resilience and what that means going forward for Californians living in our fire prone state. Good evening. Can you believe that we are here, actually here, on our beautiful Paradise High School campus to celebrate and welcome the Paradise High School graduating class of 2019 back to their home field? The fact that we are here tonight to celebrate this milestone is a miracle. Because you survived one of the most destructive wildfires in our nation's history. It left us a different people. You are the first generation of Paradise High School graduates to rise from the ashes of what life was and take a bold step forward into a new and uncertain future. But with what you've been through, you have what it takes to persevere. Congratulations and good luck. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you back for part two. Um, that was very moving. I hope everyone gets a chance to see the documentary. It's fantastic. Uh, in this section, we're gonna be talking about this funny word resiliency, um, which is kind of what you think it is. It's bouncing back how to respond to events that are inevitable as we have in California. And we're gonna be looking at what that means for folks who live in these fire prone areas. Um, joining me is uh, an amazing panel we're very lucky to have them. These are people whose jobs really are to deal with these questions in a, in a policy way and on the ground as we have basically now in California year round fire season. We're gonna talk about forest management, fire protection, home hardening, insurance premiums, and hopefully some practical solutions. As you can see, it is a massive topic, probably won't get to everything that everyone wants, but. Um, We'll have another panel at another time. So we are dealing with what they're going to be talking about are strategies for responding to fires in the face of climate change that's this cascading events of drought, 160 million dead trees around the state, and, and how that really impacts these communities. Um, we'll start, we have Senator Bill Dodd, who joins us from his home district of Napa where he has personal experience with wildfires because like a lot of Californians, he has been ordered to evacuate his own home. Um, our wine growing regions are not immune from fire and he, they've been hard hit this year with these, this barrage of 
more than 14,000 lightning strikes in, in just a day and a half or so that sparked what is now the fourth largest wildfire in the state's history. Uh, Michael Garcia, who's a fire chief for Laguna Beach in Southern California, where um, in 1983, this, excuse me, 1993, this fast moving fire destroyed more than 400 homes. Um, that fire was just kind of on the cusp of what we now know as the mega fires. It was a wind driven fire. It burned hundred acres a minute, if you wanna be a little frightened. So um, the city that the chief's in charge of is still vulnerable. It sits in um, beautiful canyons that are surrounded by chaparral and dry brush. And we'll hear from Chief Garcia uh, what he's working to do to ensure that fires like that uh, don't happen again. Uh, also with us is Ricardo Lara, who is California's insurance commissioner. This week he held a hearing where he heard from homeowners living in wildfire risk zones about their inability to get home insurance uh, or affordable insurance. And he'll share his plans um, what he's been talking with insurers about to give homeowners breaks for fireproofing their residences. And I'm sure everybody's waiting for that to happen. Finally, we have Lenya Quinn Davidson, who's on the front lines. Uh, she's a wildfire advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension. And that means she works with a host of different entities, tribes, state and federal agencies, community. So we're talking about community safe council. She knows a lot about that. She, she teaches fire resiliency. She knows a lot about prescribed burns, um, which is this preventative uh, action that a lot of people think we need to do more of. Um, and she will talk a lot about fire safe communities. So thank you everyone for joining us, the panel and the folks who are sticking around not watching the Dodger game. Um, so for the next 40 minutes or so till 6.30, um, we'll, we'll go through this. And as best I can, I will be talking, looking at, um, uh, online questions and we hope we get to you and let's begin. So Senator Dodd, um, you have authored dozens of bills that come at wildfire from many different angles. Um, what should the state prioritize now? One thing, not a whole host. What should we prioritize right now to address this problem? Prevention. Without a doubt, we need to start putting more money state money, federal money in prevention and taking the groups that uh, Lania has throughout the state of California. Nobody knows better how to deal with their local communities than the local people themselves that are trying to save their homes. And I think the state needs to uh, make sure that uh, these organizations are uh, you know, working properly and with the proper supervision with an advisor from the UC Extension. I can't think of a better way of doing that, but then to have it appropriately funded so they can get the work done. Okay, we're gonna come back and circle back uh, and pick up the thread of some of these. I wanna get everybody in the conversation to begin with. Chief Garcia, the Laguna Beach fire was 27 years ago um, and we since then we've learned a lot about fire behavior and that was a wacky one uh suppressing fires and how communities respond to them what's different today in your city that was not in place in 1993. well thank you for that question julie and uh what an amazing panel before uh, they described a lot of what we've seen the uh, fire behavior is just uh incredibly different than what we saw the fuel loading and such and, and uh, you know, I come from a community that had suffered the great fires and loss. So as such, uh, very concerned. So some of the things that we do is we have an active fire safe council, you know, our fuel, our fuel modification, all of our preventive work. And fortunately I had, you know, I visited with the group from our city, the uh, town of paradise, because we had very similar uh, traits to our city and learned a lot that I hope to talk about a little bit later as well. But uh, there's just so much, uh, so much that uh, you know that we're doing differently now and seeing now. Yeah, in your business, they always talk about lessons learned, and it seems like you're always in school with fire. So, um, Commissioner Laura, uh, many homeowners are reporting difficulties, to say the least, with their fire insurers getting dropped after filing claims, uh, or having their in premiums increased drastically, or not even being able to get insurance to begin with, which means they can't get a loan and rebuild, etc. Um, what's your agency doing to help California homeowners uh, 
living in fire zones who are having these difficulties? Thank you. You know, definitely non-renewals is a thing that continues to plague many of uh, the fire survivors. And it's, it's a twofold issue, right? First, you know, the, the devastating fires come to your town or your community, and then the inability to find uh, insurance in the admitted market continues to exacerbate problems for already a community that has suffered so much. And so what we've been working on is ensuring that people understand what their coverage is, making sure that they get the right coverage limits, but also fighting for them to make sure that we guarantee that if homeowners do everything like what he was talking about, building much more resilient, that we mandate that insurance companies cover, cover these communities and not abandon communities that by the way have, you know, for many years been customers of these insurance companies. And so, you know, we, what we have essentially seen is uh, that our consumers, our California wildfire survivors are pitted against these big insurance companies and guess who all, all usually comes out the winner is the, the insurance companies. Oh, that's so hard to believe. Uh, yet so common. Uh, Lenya, you spend your professional life teaching communities and residents how to protect themselves and their homes. That's the resilience we hear so much about. What are, you, what are your lessons? What do you tell people? Um, what's your advice? Well, I really, really liked what Senator Dodd had to say about bringing it back to the community level. And I think you know, we've seen a lot of action in the last decade by our state and federal agencies and more funding to this issue and more attention to the issue and more social license. But at the end of the day, we need to, to get back with the local people, with local indigenous people, and really be thinking about the local knowledge that's there. And because those are the people who are, you know, they're the values that are at risk and, um, and the people who are going to be most motivated to work on these issues. So I think when it comes to prescribed fire, when it comes to community wildfire protection planning, we really need to go back to the people who live there. They're the people who care, that's where the heart is, and how can we fund and empower those folks to do more um, in their own places. And these projects are uh, funded in large part by grants from the state. Um, can you talk about, I mean, it, run, it probably runs the range, it's prescribed burns, and you might explain what that is. There's mechanical treatment of, of forests mm -hmm. and land. Uh, and then if you have any prescriptions regarding home hardening and, and what in general that, that means. Yeah, so when I think about fire adaptation in, in a certain place, um, it's really multi-scalar. And I think um, Director Pimlot talked about that in the last session that, you know, it's not just about fuels treatments and it's not just about climate change and it's not just about your home. It's about all of those pieces. So when we think about it at the, you know, for a certain place, we need to think about what people can be doing at their homes to make their homes more hardened. There are some really simple things that people can do that don't cost a lot of money. Um, we, we do have policy actions, some really exciting stuff that happened this year um, with the, the, you know, that five foot zone around the house and, and really paying attention to the way that embers land on homes and ignite fires right there at the house. Um, and then we can think about the community scale and fire safe councils and prescribed burn associations and, um, you know, the, the community wildfire protection plans that make, that lay out evacuation planning and alert systems and the prioritization of fuels treatments and, and then that landscape scale of how can we use all of those treatments and tools available to us, grazing, prescribed fire, thinning, really strategically so that they're setting us up to let wildfire have more of a role in the larger landscape. So it's really multi-scalar and dimensional and um, it has to be about the things that we value and want to persist into the future. Yeah, that brings up an interesting question um, about having discussion in California about uh, when we talk about treatments of forests and fuels, reducing those, it means cutting trees, it means thinning brush, and it means fire on the landscape. And we all know it's quite a, it's a natural system. Um, for the other, for all the panelists, how difficult is it, is it to prepare Californians to watch burning that is managed and that you're herding fires around and making them do work for you? It, it's still difficult for people to see forest burn. It's difficult to see hillsides, what they think are denuded, 
Um, is that a difficult message, Chief Garcia, when, when you, you try to clear out those beautiful canyons? Uh, do people say, hey, why are you trimming that stuff? It looks nice. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that as we, as our, our population has seen some tremendous tragedies, you know, just as was described with Paradise, and they're getting, a, they're getting the message pretty, pretty, uh, pretty solidly of something needs to be done. Uh, we have to start working through those regulations. In my city, we graze. We've been grazing for uh, since those fires a little bit before. Uh, we also do hand crew work. We, we have a lot of environmental studies and we have a lot of regulations. We have to deal with coastal permits and coastal commission and environmental concerns. And it is very difficult to cut any vegetation in this state. It really is. It's a challenge. And, and just to give you a, an idea of what we go through, we're, you know, we uh, currently do about 628 acres right now, two thirds of our city, and we're looking at expanding our fuel modification zones. And when I do it by goat, I do it at about $900 an acre. When I do it by hand crew, I, you know, with all the uh, environmental um, monitoring and the permitting, I do it at $29,000 per acre. Um, so it's, it's a big challenge, it's a financial burden, but I believe it is necessary. We have to create that, that space. We have to have that management of the fuels for the protection of our communities. And we need to work together as was explained by Lenya and all the other panelists as well. Lenya, it, it, can, take, it, it can take two years to, to get a prescribed burn from conception through all the permitting and local air districts and all that kind of thing, can it? It can take a lot of time and we do put a lot of thought and planning into prescribed fire. And for those of you who are listening who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the use of fire as a tool um, under really predetermined conditions to meet certain objectives on the landscape. And we use it for a lot of different things, including fuels reduction, but also for habitat restoration and invasive species control and for cultural reasons. And, you know, I think that um, I really liked what Zan said about kind of that that large collective empathy and thinking about you know this this collective grief and loss that we're experiencing in California right now and I do think we're at a really unique time where there's so much support and interest and people want to be able to engage meaningfully with fire and so I'm seeing as someone who's worked on prescribed fire for more than a decade and really poured my whole career into it um, I, I think this is one of the most unique times for prescribed fire as far as people wanting to engage. And we just need to figure out the, the policy ways and the kind of the structural and cultural ways to unleash that interest and get folks involved and, and leverage their, their passion for it. Commissioner Lohr, did you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I also wanted just to emphasize too that, you know, with prescribed fires, we can actually control the amount of emissions that go into the environment. As somebody who's worked on air quality issues throughout my entire legislative career, we see that wiped out completely with uh, these massive wildfires. And so, you know, as we are preparing to do these prescribed burns, which I support, uh, you know, environmental folks and community folks have to understand that for those of us living in the urban core that, you know, already suffering from bad air quality, all it takes is one massive fire to zero out any emission reductions that we have uh, worked so hard for. And so these prescribed fires allow us to control the type of uh, emissions that are let out by these fires. And we also stop changing the, the pretty much the entire geographic environment of the West Coast. I mean, not allowing us to, to prescribe fire, we've allowed these canopies for these trees to grow which allow for um, you know, the bark beetle to, to expand. We get rid of all these meadows that naturally occur. And so we create more fuel load by not allowing these fires. So there is advantage for fo folks, of, those of us that live in urban cores to support uh, these prescribed fires because it, essentially without them, we wipe out all of the, the clean air regulations and policies that we put in place. Yeah, and there's 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 quite a lot of research into the the carbon and and uh, that's released by fires themselves and the air quality issues. They're far far worse and 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 more consequential than what you would get from a prescribed burn that's a low intensity fire that kind of thing. Um, Senator Dodd, 
you've been involved with crafting legislation that's that talks about what is a home that's resilient to fire i'd like you to talk about specifically if you can talk about that eaves and building materials but also compliance with something as simple or, or basic i suppose as um, a defensible space and how people insist uh, if you live in a, a redwood forest you want a, a shake roof on your house and you want a redwood deck and you want to stack your firewood right next to your house all these things that are amenities and aesthetics that people want but really go against what is fire safe so talk about what you've tried to put into place in terms of policy for the state um, and how you think that compliance is going uh, because there are penalties for not adhering to, to some of these uh, restrictions Right, uh, you know, right, right off the bat, a hundred feet of defensible space. I mean, that's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, that gives you eight times a chance of your house making it through, you know, a wildfire. And particularly when the when the home is hardened and the roofing materials and doing all these things. One of the problems is is a lot of people uh, have nice homes or just homes, but don't have really the cash to be able to do it. We've got to make grants available. Uh, Assemblymember Jim Wood has really been a champion for this uh, up on the North Coast. Not real successful yet, but let me tell you, uh, in, when I was a county supervisor in Napa, we had this 100 foot from the property lines where people would have to clear all the way around. And I thought there was gonna be an insurrection and we were all gonna be recalled. Uh, it was the most horrible thing I've ever been through. 2017, we have the fires. Now people have got a little bit more religion, except for even in the last two years, as pg and is trying to cut around the, you know, the, the or a neighbor even for that matter is trying to cut back around to, to get a hundred foot defensible space or to trim around the, you know, the power lines. We have more and more complaints. I really believe this last series of fires uh, that we've had here in 2020 are getting people really aware of what needs to be done. And uh, this home hardening and the 100 foot defensible space minimum, I think you know, I probably have more shaded fuel breaks. Uh, the, and and you know, there are some also some things that can be done. Uh, and, and Lenny, I don't know if you're aware of all these, but you know, if people have the wherewithal, even to be able to do it by hand, these retardants that you can spray on buildings uh, or even the, the foliage, I just went up to uh, St. Helena and saw a property that had that done, uh, the, you know, like two days uh, before the fire hit them. And I was just absolutely amazed. So there's a lot of things, high tech and low tech. Some things are more expensive, but there's a lot of things that are pretty inexpensive that, that homeowners could do to harden those homes. Yeah, Commissioner Laura, it, it's 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 very commonplace in uh, the insurance industry that um, they that they insurers take into account lower liability. I'm a safe driver, um, and my premium is lower. Lower. How how's it going? Talking to the industry that may just want to bail out of California, given our many calamities here. Um, how's it going? Getting them to give a break and acknowledge efforts that, that people do sometimes at great cost to ho harden their home against fire. Shouldn't they get uh, breaks on their premiums? Absolutely. And so first, you know, let's address the issue of the insurance industry in California. California is the number one insurance industry in the country, fifth in the world. And like many businesses, ins the insurance companies are diversified. And so they're doing very well in other markets. Uh, and so this whole thing about, you know, that they, they might leave California or not, well, California is still very profitable. Uh, and the fact is that we need to push, and what we've been working on is just as, the, as, as you mentioned, there's some in, 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 the, uh, in the industry who are providing some discounts if you harden your home. And we see people investing thousands of dollars. And quite honestly, sometimes even the insurance company comes and says, you need to do this, this, and this for your home. You invest the money and then you still get non-renewed. And so we think that's unfair. And we think there, there has to be a place where uh, consumers get uh, substantial discounts for investing thousands of dollars in hardening their home. Uh, and those are things that we're looking at uh, through our regulatory reforms that we're gonna be pushing uh, soon. Yeah. 
well, hope we uh, have some luck with that. They're, they're kind of stubborn. Um, <laughs> for anybody in the That's panel, me. Lenya, <laughs> yeah, okay, You're, you are too, right? Um, <laughs> Lenya, California recently signed an agreement with the U.S. Forest Service uh, to deal with fuel reductions on uh, and set a goal of a million acres a year. And I think most of us know by now that that California is not the biggest uh, landowner here. The, the big landlord of our forests is the U.S. Forest Service. So that is a very... Uh, ambitious goal, considering we, it's just a tiny percentage, maybe 100,000 acres that are treated per year. Um, you've mentioned this idea that this is the wrong metric, that acres burned is, or, or burning and, and setting an acreage as, as a goal is, is we're just going to chase those numbers. Tell me, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think this is a great point, Julie, and something you and I have talked about. And let me give an example. I think that I think that acres are a really easy metric for us to think about, whether we're talking about this, you know, how bad of a fire season we've had, um, or whether we're talking about fuels treatments. And I think think about this year. You know, we've had about 4.2 million acres burned in California this year. And all of us in our in our media work and everything we're hearing is that this is, you know, a crazy amount of acres. We haven't seen anything like this in five decades. And let's think about pre-European settlement when scientists estimate that approximately 4.5 million acres burned every year in California. We actually haven't even reached the historical annual acreage that was burned in California every year. Um, and a lot of that was ignited by humans. You know, a lot of that was Native American burning. And a lot of it was, was just, it was a natural part of the California ecosystem. So is the fact that we've had 4.2 million acres this year, is that, does that represent a major departure for us from what we think of as normal? Um, maybe, but only in a short time span. So in a wildfire focus, I think it's, it's not necessarily a useful metric. It's really about where and how and when those fires are burning and how they're affecting our communities and our landscapes and our habitats. Well, it's the same if you think about prescribed fire and fuels treatments. Um, it doesn't really matter if we're treating a million acres a year or 500,000 acres a year. Um, it matters when and how and where we're doing it and who's involved and how strategic it is. And is it getting us to the place we need to be? So if we're, you know, if we're using prescribed fire, for example, but we're burning some random patch of ground out in the middle of nowhere that's not affecting any future fire potential, is that getting us where we want to go? Um, so I really think we need new metrics. We need new ways of talking about how the quality of our treatments, whether they be prescribed fire or grazing or thinning, um, you know, are, what's the quality? It's not about the quantity. We, the acres are, are meaningless when they're not in the context of what's important to us and what we're trying to get to. Yeah, I've, I've heard that a lot. And, and, and you mentioned uh, a, an interesting issue, a side issue. There are states like Florida that do a lot of prescribed burns, millions of acres a year, and they allow homeowners who, who get permitted to do their own work. Um, and you mentioned earlier today a problem with these prescribed burns. If you do allow homeowners to do it or they're private entities, what is the liability? They can't, they are not indemnified when they do that and they may be held liable. Um, Chief Garcia, do you allow homeowners in, in, in your community to, to do any prescribed burns or um, anything, any treatment that involves that kind of thing? Even actually, even when you use chainsaws and, and other machinery that can spark a fire and some people don't like to see that. So would you allow homeowners um, to do prescribed burns of their own if they're trained? In our community, we don't do pre uh, prescribed burns. We do grazing and we do hand crew work. Uh, right. So for our community, we would, we would not allow them to do a pre um, prescribed burn. Uh, as you know, that that is, uh, that is very dangerous and of, of itself as a tool. It has to be in certain situations. It needs to be controlled and there's a lot of variables there. But the key point that I really like that you bring up is the homeowner. Uh, our, our fuel mod work that we do around Laguna is specific around our city. It's that 100 foot band where we, uh, that we're creating that buffer. We're changing the dynamic of the fire, uh, losing some of the heat, the flame length, uh, giving us an opportunity of that defensible space to make a stand, but also giving our community a chance to evacuate and get out safely. And with that, if 
we do that work and our homeowners aren't doing the work on their property and they're leaving that natural vegetation, a single ember jumps over, starts that, and we start having a, you know, it spread from house to house. So we are um, greatly encouraging our homeowners to take care of their own vegetation and do it safely. Yeah. Senator Dodd, there's a question from our audience. Um, do you know of any local cities and towns in California that are restricting development in fire prone areas? Um, I, I mean, th th there's a precedent for that kind of thing that Santa Fe, New Mexico doesn't allow any new development unless you can show that there's a source of water. I mean, this, it's not without precedent and we, we tell people where they can live regarding floods, um, earthquake zones. Do you know any city or locality that's doing that? Uh, no, I don't actually. We had a bill in, um, and I believe it was Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, who's now uh, finishing up her uh, lengthy tenure in, in the California State Legislature, had a bill uh, that would do that and, 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 and give uh, local communities the tools that they need to be able to perhaps reject new developments in, uh, because of fires and things that they could do tools. Uh, it, it actually got held. I can't remember it got held in, uh, it was before uh, Ricardo Lara, uh, Commissioner Lara left as, as the appropriations chairman. It got held, I think, by the next one at any rate. Uh, but, um, and, and the reason was, you know, we've, we've got to really think this out. We've got conflicting policies in the state of California. And honestly, there was some significant argument about, hey, we have these housing uh, the, this affordability uh, problem in the state of California, we've got to build more housing. And yet what they thought this would do perhaps is to give counties or cities the ability to reject housing when they have, you know, that, that could be the answer for everything. So I think more thought needs to be in that. And we just, I really believe the policy uh, needs to be developed, which gives communities the legitimate right to stop developments or maybe change the size of the developments, the density of the developments in those fire prone areas. Yeah, the state doesn't really have a role there. It's, it's really a zoning issue or can be, it can be seen through that lens. Um, uh, Commissioner Laura you used to be in the legislature and, and in the middle of all this kind of thing. Is that politically untenable in California to start bossing people around about where they can live, how they build, what kind of homes they have, that sort of thing? No, you know, I think uh, it would be ridiculous for us not to have these conversations at the state level in terms of looking at land use uh, and empowering communities. And, and, you know, the fact is that I, I honestly think insurance can be used as a tool to incentivize the rebuilding in a way that's much more resilient, uh, in a way that makes much more sense for certain communities. And this is why we're working on figuring out how do we create community-wide mitigation standards so that the community understands what they need to do that, uh, to lower the risk uh, as a community. Uh, we, again, we see what people do parcel by parcel and what currently exists is a patchwork of different programs that at the end of the day, don't provide you a standardized way of being able to you know, either bring the insurance industry in, bring consumers in, bring local governments and say, this is what we need to do in this town to bring, lower the risk, which I think in turn keeps the insurance market in a community. But we have to talk about land use and we have to figure out how we build in certain communities uh, and, and again, also meet the needs of, uh, of housing, that we, the housing shortage, right? But we can't deny that building in very environmentally sensitive communities is can can continue and not have to revisit this issue, uh, but we have to respect the the historic nature of a lot of these towns in the foothill. We have to respect the local community, but also help in guiding them and giving them the resources to be able to still meet their housing needs, but without having to build and continue to build out into very environmental sensitive areas. And I think we need to be, the state has to be part of that conversation as well as the insurance industry because it could be used as an effective tool to allow us to build much more resilient and also curb some of the development in environmental sensitive areas. 
you know, what, we, what we're doing now is for the first time we, in the department, we actually unveiled a, a database of environmentally friendly insurance products that give you discounts in certain products that if you rebuild in a much more resilient way, if you invest in, you know, uh, solar power, if you do these things, the insur this, these insurance products help you not only provide coverage for your home, but give you the proper incentives so that you can rebuild in a much more resilient way. And that's what we need to help Paradise and these towns do. That's gonna take resources, that's gonna take time because as you, we've seen with Paradise, we're not talking about you know, um, ski chalets in Lake Tahoe. We're talking about people who have been pushed out of the urban core, people who are retirees, people who are disabled and need, an and need resources to be able to you know, continue to live rightfully in the community that they love. Yeah, and, and you brought up a, a good point. I, I wanted to tell our audience and remind you that uh, we'll be pro providing links to some of the uh, websites and documentation that our, our panelists are, are talking about. Um, Commissioner Laura, you talked about these environmentally sensitive areas, which are sometimes synonymous with the, the beautiful landscapes that people want to live next to and amongst. Lenya, when you were talking about uh, prescribed burns and making them very specific and very discreet, um, how do you, and, and maybe for you, Chief Garcia, how do you balance this need to clear these fuels, make places safe, maintain watersheds, maintain habitat, for the animals who live there as well and who provide services for us all um, and keep the landscape that we're used to seeing. It, 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 it requires a lot of precision, doesn't it? It certainly requires a lot of planning and thought. And that, I think that's really where that, that community piece comes in and that the local knowledge and the local values and trying to understand what it is um, folks are working toward. And so with prescribed fire, yeah, I saw some questions in the chat, and these are great questions about different fuel types and different vegetation types, and where is it appropriate to use these tools? And, you know, like Chief Garcia said, it, it, he's not using that in his community. Well, that makes sense. In Southern California, there are some areas where prescribed fire is not an appropriate tool necessarily, not going to get the communities to what they what they need. And it's always got to be a local emphasis about what you know what makes sense for that place and what the best tools are and um but yeah there's a lot of a lot of precision and a lot of thought and planning that goes into it and just a lot of of subjective value judgments about what we, what we care about and what we're trying to protect and so i think um when, when it comes to you know the areas of california which are large parts of california that were adapted to historically frequent fire and to cultural burning and you know our ponderosa pine forests and our oak woodlands and our grasslands and in those places prescribed fire is an excellent tool for just making sure those those things persist on the landscape and um, we have a lot of great resources and information available to know how to use fire in the best way yeah chief garcia i presume when you talk about grazing you're, you're referring to goats yes we use goats and you know to kind of get into the core of your question is we embraced our uh, environmentalist and our environmental concerns. Uh, we just can't keep butt butting heads. Uh, this affects everybody. Right. And we do have fed federally protected and state protected vegetation. We have locally protected vegetation that are concerns. And uh, we are working with them. We have environmental monitoring. We have hand crew work. Because our goal is to make it as safe as possible for the homeowners. And at some point, we have to put this to action. We can talk about this each and every day. But at some point, we have to start doing some work that's going to make our community safer. So we embrace them. We have them a part of it. We don't always see eye to eye, but we are moving forward and making our community safer. And we have a plan and we're acting on it. That sounds like you've touched every base. Congratulations. And thank you for sharing. No, <laughs> please stay with us. Um, Senator Dodd. It's been, uh, as we all know, a bit of a wacky year and the legislature, the bandwidth and the money to deal with some of these issues is limited. Um, fire, it, resolution of fire problems in the state, it's not all about money, but um, it's, it's a lot of all this kind of detailed, detailed wonky decisions that involve people who understand fire and scientists. In other words, what's the legislature going to do now uh, we've talked a lot. There's been blue ribbon commissions. There's every council known to man. What's going to happen now? 
Um, and is that is fire going to go back to the the top of the the important things in terms of what you all are going to try to get accomplished? Well, as we look at a you know arguably forty five to fifty million billion excuse me dollar deficit in the state of California, absent any significant help from the federal government, um, these money sources, um, you know, particularly a lot of the prevention dollars that we've been able to get you know, over the last few years was from uh, cap and trade money. Well, you know, with the economy down, that is kind of, uh, you know, that, that is not a, a, a source of money that's, uh, that's endless. And so we're going to have to be looking for new sources. It may even still in this low interest rate environment to so that we can get ahead of it, we might have to bond on some revenue streams that, uh, that we have. There may be, you know, look, nobody wants fees or anything else, but we have to do whatever we have to do to get money uh, in, in, into these areas. And I think that, uh, uh, I, I think that's really what we're going to be working on. When we did uh, SB 901 in, in 2018, uh, we, we were able to get a billion dollars for, uh, for you know, forest uh, health and redu reduction of fuels. We still haven't uh, spent a lot of that money, COVID being part of the reason, but we have to do a more effective job at getting this money out. Senator, I mean, Assemblymember Wood, uh, Senator, now Senator Dolly, who, you know, really have the whole North state when you look at it. Uh, you know, in their assembly districts, they were so circumspect in, in, in SB 901 to, the, you know, they, they wanted, you know, probably $5 billion. The, the, this is something that they've seen time and time again. Now we're starting to see it, you know, closer to urban areas and it's affecting everybody in the state of California. And we just have to, uh, you know, focus on that prevention piece. We've spent Eight hundred thousand, uh, eight hundred million dollars in firefighting in two thousand four. Today, it's three point three billion dollars is our budget, uh, and most of that is in fire suppression, not prevention. We've got to change those numbers, and I think we've got to do it first in the state. We have five percent, as opposed to federal government's fifty-seven percent of the lands. But I got it. The five percent that the state of California owns should be an example to the federal government and to all private property owners of the best way it could be done. Right. Um, Senator, uh, Commissioner Laura, do you have um, just a last parting words? We've got a few minutes left. Absolutely. What, do you, what do you want to tell people who are watching this, who are concerned about the, their ability to get affordable insurance to not be dropped and all those questions you've been hearing from constituents? I just want to tell them that, you know, your insurance commissioner is fighting for you. We are going to continue to work towards guaranteeing them coverage once they harden their home. It's the best way we can incentivize good behavior by uh, mandating that insurance companies give you the discounts you need to be able to, you know, um, rebuild much more resilient and also be able to do the home hardening that everybody's been discussing. Uh, unfortunately, right now, not a lot of the companies, insurance companies are doing so. We're going to hopefully work on regulations to make sure that, that that happens and that we give you the transparency that you need to understand these wildfire models that uh, give you an opportunity to mitigate so that you can lower your score and continue to have affordable and available insurance in your community. And to our fire, to fire experts very quickly, um, so much of American firefighting is about suppression, as Senator Dodd said. Uh, stamping out every ember, not letting these fires work for us. Um, do we need to have a discussion about that so people understand that sometimes fire can, fire can be a tool? Uh, Chief Garcia, why don't you go first? Well, that's a great question. I think that um, when we get called, it's because it's in the urban interface. And many times in these urban interfaces, with the density of our fuels and our weathers and our topography, we don't have the ability. But uh, I want you to know, what, as Lenya was talking about, putting fire on the ground and using that as a tool is a firefighter tactic as well. And it is being used in our state successfully. Um, but deep into, the, uh, deep into the forest, I know that we do uh, you know, let the fire run its course many times, but in the, in the wooey areas, I think it's time for us and we have to continue to act. 
I would like to see a change. I'd like to see a lot more per, uh, prevention going on and reducing these uh, operational costs. Lenya, yeah, about a minute. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the social license is there. I think people understand the issue. I think people are are getting a sense that fire's got to be part of California's future. And we have so many great tools and resources available to us. So I just I want to encourage people, don't feel overwhelmed by the climate narrative, by the fuels narrative. Like there are there, it's all very big, but it's stuff that we can work on and we have tools. And look at the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network, learn about training exchanges for prescribed fire, get involved with your local prescribed burn association. Um, we have so much great stuff going on in California right now. And I, I really look forward to talking more with Senator Dodd and um, Commissioner Lara about the opportunities there. I have great ideas for policy work that wouldn't require a lot of money and could really make a big change in the prescribed fire world. So let's keep talking. And um, yeah, I think we're at a tipping point. It's exciting yeah. time right now. If you're, if you're talking, it's bound to be a long conversation when it comes to fire in California. I want to thank all of our guests. You've been very generous with your time. I'm sure everyone has, has learned a lot through your expertise. And thanks again to Imagine Entertainment and National Geographic for their help in putting this event together. And to remind you all that uh, Rebuilding Paradise will be premiered on Sunday, November 8th at 9 p.m. on the Nat Geo channel. And... Thank you all for being with us. And remember that my colleague Rachel and I will be writing about this forever, I think. And if you'd like to see what we've done and what our colleagues do covering the state of California, go to calmatters.org. So good night. Thank you all for joining us and be safe.